Hello everyone. It is April 27th and I am doing a live stream and um, that's what day it is. It's 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I don't know the difference between Eastern Standard Time, EST and EDT, to be honest with you. It's something I probably should look up. And um, Vega is here. I know Vega, actually. Well, not really, but just through YouTube. Hi, Vega. Good to have you here. Let me move that. I'm learning how to um, move some of the text box over to the screen with my cool software. And I like my software. It works really well. Um, now that I'm learning how to use it. So um, I'm going to let a few people get on. I think I um, have a few people signing in. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, hey, Daniel. Daniel, you, do you notice um, uh, how I can put that up there? And let's see. And there's Mike. Hi, Mike. So I'm putting your, your uh, messages up. But if you say nasty things, I won't put it up. I have a choice of which ones I drag over. And um, hopefully good stuff. And then there's um, Mark. Hey, Mark, how are you? Thank you for saying hello. Thank you for showing my bicep in there. That's the big bicep. Thank you. Jill. Oh my gosh, Jill. Good evening, Jill from Malaysia. I like just saying that. It makes me feel like I have a very international live stream if I say hi, Jill from Malaysia. Um, if anyone is uh, signing in and uh, checking this out from a country other than the United States, uh, please let me know because it's fun. And here's um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Roberson. Hello, Doc. Jeffrey, thank you. Jeffrey, where do you live? Um, and I'm going to just give this a minute for people to log in. And I have a whole setup today, uh, as I have been in the last few weeks. I'm trying to do these on Monday nights, and I'm going to do my best to stay consistent. Um, but I have a little thing on how to roll out your back and possibly how to crack your own upper back. Uh, it works for me. I don't know if it'll work for you, but I'll show you the trick when you're using a foam roller. Um, let's see, uh, Asad Riaz. Hi, Asad. And, oh, look, I know Siobhan. Uh, hi, Siobhan from New York. Thanks for joining in. I love the, uh, spelling of doctor. See, for people that don't know, that's like a doctor. That's, uh, like a New York type of slang. I like that. That's really cool. Berto. Um, So that's a good question, Berto. I didn't hop into questions yet, but I'll answer that in a second. But basically, we work on each other. And um, I don't know what other people called it, but I always called it sparring. So you have to get in and work it out with each other. There's no practice dummies. The only practice dummy I ever had was from my CPR class. Um, and then here, here's someone um, big time from the Philippines. That's awesome. Thanks for clocking in. Uh, Siobhan says... Um, Happy to be on the live stream from Queens. Thank you. Hi, Matt, Ma, Mike uh, from Brooklyn. And you see I'm dragging all these over because I'm getting high tech here. Uh, three thirds. Three thirds is a cool name because it means he's everything. Three thirds is full house, right? It's all of it. Then there's uh, Daniel McGee from Washington. Great pickup truck. I love that. So we have a bunch of people on... Um, Oh, Jeffrey said, um, what did he say? He said, let me see. South Florida returned from Rwanda last June after living there for two years. That's very interesting. Were you on some type of um, mission serving there? or um, That sounds really cool. Very nice. Um, be curious to hear about that one day. So um, if you were, thank you for your service, Jeffrey. Uh, that sounds like a cool thing. 
Um, so I have, a, I have a, some fun stuff today. I feel there's always a little responsibility if I'm going to um, do this, then I also should try to make you uh, answer some questions, make it a little educational. Hopefully I have some, I have some compilations. I have some adjusting clips because I know that you really, most of you really watch my channel because you like watching the chiropractic adjustments. So I put that on there. Um, in today's lineup, I also have um, uh, just some funny things and like to put some um, uh, space for questions uh, that come up too. So I'll show a few slides, then we'll do some Q&A, then I'll show a few slides, Q&A, and so on. Um, and let's see, one more nice one from Berto. Uh, thank you. Oh, more people signed in. Uh, this is nice. Um, Especially compliments. I make sure I don't miss any compliments with my fragile male ego. I like to hear all the compliments I can get. So this is uh, Serdar from Turkey, Istanbul. You're amazing, Doxy. That was the compliment part. Thank you. You're amazing too. I appreciate it. I, I don't remember who it was, but um, maybe I was at some lecture or, or workshop and it said, if anyone ever gives you a compliment, you should write it out on a piece of paper and put it on your refrigerator because... Uh, in times that are, we feel low about ourselves, it's nice to remember what our friends and loved ones think about ourselves and, and lift the mood. Uh, so it's nice to, um, to have that. Um, but here, here's, Jeffrey's actually answering the question. Um, let me go to a different slide because there might be more room. Um, so let me put Jeffrey back up there. Um, there he goes. Okay, so worked with uh, Civil Aviation Authority. Also spent three years in Shanghai. Love your videos. Thank you. So you are busy and international. So this is me uh, meditating today. No, that's not me, but I thought it was a funny picture of a dog meditating. And wouldn't that be great? So um, I don't know if you guys want to see this, but I'm trying to be transparent. Oh, one more, and then I'm going to start. Uh, that was Alvin from an Indonesia. Wow, that's pretty cool. People from all over logging in. Uh, hi, Alvin. Thank you for checking this out. Um, so if, if you guys don't want to see this, you could say you're not interested. But I don't know. The channel's been accelerating a lot. I'll show you last week's number on Monday night. And this is today's number as of about 4 o'clock today when I set up the slideshow. Um... So as of today, uh, my YouTube channel, which is a year old or 53 weeks old, has 23,660 subscribers, 9,000 new subscribers in the last 28 days, um, and 1.4 million views in the last 28 days. So if we go to the next slide, I put them side by side. So last week is the one on top with 1 million views over a 28-day period. And you could see the increase in just a week and seven days uh, there. Um, hold on, someone else is saying hello. Um, we already saw three thirds. And here is Rana from India. Hello, Rana. Yes, and then Vega picked up on the fact that I have not had my hair cut today, but because I wanted to pay homage to my amazing barber shop that's about 50 meters from my house, I live in a part of Brooklyn called Williamsburg. And Williamsburg has different sections. There's a Hasidic Jewish section. There's a young hipster section. There's the, the richer area. I live in um, South Williamsburg uh, in a very Dominican area. And I love it here. I've been here about, I don't know, five Five years now, maybe a little longer, six years. And there's a barbershop that's a very family, community, neighborhood barbershop that I go to. And going there every three or four weeks, which what Vega pointed out is my hair's getting, for me, long and my beard's getting long. Um, I was able to, um, I'm not able to get there and enjoy that. And um, Dr. Pierce, a daughter is a student at the Manhattan School of Music. Hope to visit you when, oh, that's very nice. Um, so Dr. Pierce was just saying that. And then uh, Daniel 
Yeah, that would be nice to visit one day. That would be great. That's a great school, by the way. Congratulations for her and you. Um, but anyway, that's the stat I'm just showing you. And, and um, unless you guys think that's uh, inappropriate, I'll just put that up because I, I kind of feel that um, this channel is our channel, not my channel. I mean, I do the content, obviously, but I also feel uh, and I'm understanding that it's it's a community. So people leave me comments and I check in with people and I do my best to uh, comment back as much as I can. I answer questions. I see how people are responding or engaging with the videos, which makes me fine tune uh, future videos. And let me say, before we go into the next one, there's two other people I want to say hello to. So um, hello, um, Abderazak, thank you for saying hello. And um, and then Soren, um, Soren from Romania. Now, Romania just had an earthquake. Uh, do you know, Soren, what the uh, earthquake was on the Richter scale? But you said that it shook you up pretty bad, but it didn't uh, cause any personal injury or harm, which is nice. Um, so if you type that in, I'll drag it over. So I have um, a question that I get a lot especially on Instagram is how do I crack my own back? And it's difficult. Some people just do it naturally. They, they twist or they, you know, they do their neck. Um, and, um, leaning over a chair, twisting the lower back. But one cool way is, uh, to use a foam roller. And I don't know if you guys can see in this picture, um, let me move this around a little bit, but I like though to really wrap my arms like this and I'll show you in another picture because if my hands are behind my neck, nothing pops. But if I grab it like this and notice I'm grabbing my own back with my fingertips. Did you ever do that when you were a kid like, or still do it as an adult where you you wrap your hands behind you and you pretend you're hugging yourself. I guess I still do that. Oh, Soren said it was, uh, so Soren is someone that follows the, um, the channel and we've been communicating and enjoying uh, a friendship through this. And uh, he told me that they had a uh, earthquake, 4.6 on the Richter scale is pretty powerful. Um, so thank goodness you and your family are okay. And I wish you all the best. Um, and then, um, someone said, Scotty, thank you. He said, um, I'm doing a good job explaining things. One of my fears of getting on a live stream or even putting up videos in the first place is I always think that people say, um, you know, that, that I don't know enough to to put out content. And so even though I've been doing this for 20 some odd years and I feel like I'm an expert in my own little sliver of a, of a niche, um, I, there's still a insecurity that you just don't know enough and people will call you out. And, and I do get that. Ooh, I do get that a little bit. Um, but I try to push on and know that there'll be haters anyway, but I hope enough people enjoy it or at least see my sincerity. I'm uh, trying to do a good job. So this is another way to lay on the foam roller, which is you put the foam roller lengthwise and you just lay on it. And it's really nice. And it just opens up the ribs, opens up the back. And if you remember uh, what I talked about last week on the live stream and it's, it's posted, uh, you could check it out if you want or scroll to the part where I talk about the doorway stretches and um, stretching the front of the hips. One of the big themes of what I was teaching last week is that I feel that everybody could strengthen the posterior chain of the body more and stretch the anterior part of the body more. And so in this position, it's very passive. You don't have to do anything. You just lie on this. But notice that the foam roller is going vertically up and down the, the back. And this woman is in a position of draping her body over it. Um, and there's more foam roller pictures. Cause I think this is important. Um, so 
Notice how this young man is holding his arms. That's the way to make your back crack. Okay, I'm giving you a big tip here. So you grab your back like this, I mean your body, with the deep go under. And then keep tight like that. And let's go to the next one. And then go to here. And you might have a chance of cracking your back here. And if it does, it's going to be amazing. You could also do that on the floor tonight. So if you don't have a foam roller, grab yourself like that. Get on the floor, but not even a hard floor like a tiles or wood. And then roll back and see if you can crack it. Feels really good. So let's see. Um, let's see. So now I have um, a compilation. So I told you I'm gonna mix this up. I'm gonna have some Q&A. We'll stop, do some q and I'm doing a little q and in between, um, but I also wanna show some videos. So this is a, a cracking video from the beginning of last year. I think this was patients that we taped in May and June of 2019. Um, let me just see. And someone named Jay Lee says hello. So let's see. Okay, so here's the first compilation. There it goes. Nice. There we go. Oh, this elevate your hips was part of the foam roller one. So we did that. We did this. And um, Q&A. little time for Q&A. I just thought that was a funny picture. It made me laugh. Um, I love uh, dogs and cats and all sorts of horses. I love horses. I love uh, animals. And I'm studying animal chiropractic this year. I'm about two-thirds of the way through and it got stalled out a little bit because of the coronavirus, but I'm hoping to fly back to Texas to do my last module of study, which is like a 40-hour week crammed into three days where we get tested. We work on horses and dogs. Uh, last time I was down, we worked on some rodeo horses, a lot of dogs, where we're adjusting under supervision. It's taught by two veterinarians and um, they're small classes. so. Maybe 10 doctors show up for the studies. Um, last time I was there, where there were uh, eight veterinarians and two chiropractors, so it's more vets. It's really tough. Uh, there's so much uh, anatomy to learn, neurology, uh, pathology. Uh, it's a lot more than I thought it was going to be, but I like the challenge. And then in September, again, if it's not canceled, uh, is the one time a year chance to take the national boards and it's given in Oklahoma. So I would have to fly to Oklahoma Friday night, I think is the written test, and then all day Saturday is the practical test where you have to demonstrate your knowledge and expertise working on both horses and dogs while there's a judge that goes around and asks you questions with a clipboard and sees how much you know and whether you're competent or not. And then based on your written score, and your uh, practical testing, you'll find out in a couple of weeks whether you passed it. And the name of that, um, the name of that organization is called AVCA. Um, let me see. I'll drag that on there. So it's called the um, American Veterinarian Chiropractic Association. And it's really cool. It's been around for about 25 years, and there are not a lot of people that do it uh, or do it through that group. Um, 
comparatively, like there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of chiropractors across the United States and other countries even more, um, but not that many want to uh, work with animals and humans. Um, so, um, question came in, and this is our little question section. So, Cirque was asking any advice before my ACL surgery. Well, not really, because with a, um, anterior cruciate ligament surgery, you know, if, I mean, you seem like in the picture, you seem like a young guy. Um, there's not, like, if you said, oh, I'm getting ready for open heart surgery, I might have a little more advice where I would say, diet and exercise as much as you can before the surgery. But in your case, you're gonna get your knee worked on. And the big thing is to uh, recover. So, um, you know, you wanna put your focus on recovering as fast as you can and getting into rehab to strengthen it. Um, I do believe that flexibility is gonna be a big, a big piece for you. It's not just strength, it's flexibility. So you're gonna to wanna to work on your hips, your lower back, your quads, your hamstrings, even your calves and really work and give credit to the importance of flexibility as you rehab a knee or ankle injury. Uh, hi, Stacy. Stacy says, uh, hello, and we're gonna move on. Oh, so Vega has a question. Let's put up Vega's question. So she says, does an occipital lift by definition always include an occiput adjustment? Sometimes you set up uh, on the occipital lift and say, I'm on C2 or something like, that so you're right that's probably incorrect of me um the occipital lift should be on the occiput so the name of these moves are really named after the uh the vertebral segment that you're contacting so a c2 adjustment you should be on c2 an occipital lift i should be on the occiput so if you could find an example i'd love to see it where you'd say hey look at this timestamp, this is where you said that. Um, you know what's funny is, uh, and I don't know if this is sufficient enough, Vega, but um, to me what's funny is that for 21 years I didn't really say out loud what I was adjusting, unless a patient specifically asked me, what are you adjusting right now? Usually people are just breathing and quiet and trying to uh, surrender to the process, and I don't look up and I go to a camera Right now, I'm gonna adjust C2 on the right because it's tight and the SCM muscle, and I wanna see if I can make a difference. So once I started doing these video things, I find myself talking to the camera, and it is kind of strange. Uh, you know, it's not something I normally did for 21 years, that's a lot. And then, like, pushing myself to talk about it. And so I guess there's times that I'm not being accurate with my description, that's probably true, um, but what I do feel confident is I feel like my hands are on the spot that needs work because that I do at this point intuitively. And I think it's very similar, although I'm not a musician, but I would imagine a piano player that's really good at playing the piano, uh, you know, they're at, at a high level, maybe an expert level. They're not thinking of what finger their, what note their finger is on. They're not feeling what chord they're playing. Uh, they're not making that type of mental connection, they just do it. So I got to a point in 22 years and over 120,000 treatments that I've given, and that's an accurate number, that's not an exaggeration, um, because I do five to 6,000 treatments a year and multiply that out by 22 years. Uh, and before that, I also did a couple of years at a smaller number, but but around 6,000 treatments a year at that pace. Um, but anyway, I know, my hands just know, and then I don't, can't always get my brain to say the word out loud, but I just know the spot. I know where it hurts, and I can get my hands on it. Um, let's see, someone said, my, my current chiropractor knows I need an occipital, but doesn't do an occipital. Should I mention this to him? Um, you know, the occipital, here's the question, uh, the occipital lift, uh, here I can shorten that. Maybe you could read it a little better. Um, the occipital lift, I don't know if it's taught in every school. It's kind of an old school adjustment and it's really not the only way to do it. So very dramatic way to do it is you sit someone on the table and you climb up and grab their head and lift it. But 
There are some uh, videos of me adjusting people where I'm just tilting the head, they're lying on their back, and that's a much safer way really to do it. It's less dramatic. Um, you know, I'm learning to also entertain here. So if I did only the most boring adjustments that aren't visual, uh, no one tunes in. So, um, you know, especially if I have the right person in the room with me when I'm videotaping, if they say to me, yeah, you can do any technique on me, I'm up for this, this is so much fun, then it gives me a little room to like show off. But when I have, let's say, my mom, who's uh, 79 years old, come into my office, I don't show off on my mom. I try to be gentle and precise, and I'm not caring how loud the crack is, because the last thing I want to do is hurt her. Uh, not that I want to hurt someone that's in their 20s, but someone that's in their 20s has a lot more elasticity, flexibility, and stability uh, than an 80-year-old person. And so there are much different risk factors and you adjust who's in front of you or you modify technique, force, uh, range of motion to the specific person in front of you and their history and what they're going through. Um, so here, so uh, here's a question which I'm going to answer next actually with my next slides. How come it's easier for you to do neck adjustments so light and still hear big cracks? And it depends which microphone I'm using. I'm going to share that with you. It's not even going to be a secret. Um, so, oh, this was nice. Uh, Cirque said thank you from Croatia. So it's great that you're tuning in. Um, let's see. Um, Nuriga. Nuiga. Let's see. I was a wrestler. Let's see what he has to say. I do wrestling for more than 24 years, sometimes feel lower back pain and I feel like my pain got blocked. I don't know if it's normal for someone who practices the sport. I, I was a wrestler. Um, my brother is a black belt in jujitsu and black belt in judo and still competes in his late 50s um, at the master's level. Quite, quite busy with his competition. I think he's had, just in the last six or seven years, he's had over 150 matches. Uh, so he's really into it. But I, um, I don't compete, uh, but I did for years uh, in wrestling and really loved it. Uh, wrestling's intense. I mean, wrestling <laughs> beats you up after the years go by. So um, we'd have to talk more about your back. Um, you know, I don't know your age. There, there's just so many questions I would ask you if I was doing an intake and trying to come up with a way to set up a game plan to, to help you. Um, I know that's not going to answer your question right now, but this is not a format where I can answer your question right now. Uh, Sophia is saying hello. It's 7.25 a.m. in uh, South Korea. That's so nice that you're checking this out. Um, let's see, the dog. Yeah, I just thought it was a kooky looking dog and thought it would be fun to put the dog up. So hi, our Arsenal Manic. Um, so what's the best stretch for SI joints? Hmm. Well, I really like anything to open the front of the hips. And if you look at my last week's live stream, I went into that a little bit. I scrubbed to where you see the pictures of the uh, anatomy. That way you don't have to watch the whole video and just watch like the five minute section. And I talk about opening up the front of the hips helps the back and the back of the hips and the SI joint. Um, so Matt Carter, um, and I'm going to hit some more questions before I go to the next part of my slides. Um, actually, my next thing I'm coming up with is a, uh, showing you some of the barbershop stuff that I took behind the scenes of my local barber where I adjust people while they're in the chair. Now, wow, Matt has this big, what is that, a big Steiner uh, glass. Um, I tried that once when I was with my son. Um, so he's uh, blind in one eye and I find myself turning my neck to the right. That could be the reason why I always have pain on the side of the neck. Yeah. So if you're blind in one side or have some type of limitation of sight, you'll be favoring. And what would be interesting to do would be to have someone um, take maybe 30 seconds of a films of you talking to them. So this is what I want you to do, Matt. You sit in a chair directly across from someone that's willing to help you. Face-to-face, uh, -face, same height, straight on, just like you were in an interview. And um, 
and they take their camera out and as they're talking to you, they film you talking to them. And I bet you'll see your head is a little, let me move this way, your head's a little cocked, it's a little turned. The other thing you could do is you stand in what you think is a neutral position and they take again a close-up picture of your face and see if there's little tilts. Then what you can do uh, is also stretch more. So the neck stretches in six different directions. So it goes forward, back, rotate right. See, do you see how it's mirror image? So that's why it's weird sometimes. I'm trying to point at the picture, but the picture is actually over here. Um, rotation to one side, rotation to the other, and then lateral flexion. So let me get rid of the uh, picture of the dog for a second. So this is lateral flexion. And do you notice that I grab the ear? Because you get more leverage. And when you do the rotation, I want you to put your thumb, do this while you're watching this so you learn. My thumb is behind my ear and my fingers are along the mandible and my elbow's high and I get nice rotation. So there's rotation, rotation, lateral flexion, grab as much of the ear as you can. Notice I'm covering the whole ear and then tilt. And you can sit on your other, you can sit on your other hand, which pulls your arm down. And then tilt away, right? And then tilt away. And then there's flexion and extension. So flexion, you're pulling down. And extension, I get my thumbs under my chin. And sometimes it even cracks when I do that. So Matt, you could do that and improve it and you'll see it'll, it'll get a lot better. Um, Matt says he feels like his head's never on correct. That's a whole video right there for us, Matt. We'll talk about that. You'll have to buy me a beer if I do that video. Um, so here's a, a lot of questions. So this is good. All right, so um, doctor, I wanna ask you about a lumbar belt to wear, you know, um, what I, my thought with lumbar belts is they're a really good idea. Um, but you don't wear them all day long. You do it when you need it. So if you wear it all day long, it loses its effectiveness. And um, you have, uh, you want to like, you want to like strap it on really strong and do your lifting or your heavy work. And then every moment that you can, you open it up and then you put it on tight again. And that would be a much better way to use that. But I think, um, Abderazak, if you go back to last, I'm sorry, but keep referring to last week's video because I had a really good section on strengthening the back. You need those extension exercises and work on your posterior chain, and I think that'll be a big difference. Um, let me go look at some more questions. Um, so Anderson uh, says, hey, Doc, I have bad neck pain. What can I do about it? Um, you could stretch more. Um, I like, I think we're way too forward in life. We're texting, our heads are forward. So we really want to stretch the front of our neck. So you really want to push your head back, um, do neck extensions, do the six stretches that I just showed you in all six directions that the neck move in. Um, and you can also probably use less pillows than you're using. I hardly use a pillow. I have like the, the thinnest little pillow that goes behind my head so that my back of my head is actually touching the mattress. Maybe I'll do a video on, on what pillows I use because it's going to surprise you. Um, let's see. Um, Sir, that's a big question. Um, I'll put it up just because it's people be curious. My mom defeated lung cancer. Congratulations on that. That's amazing. She had surgery one year ago. My best to her, please. Um, she's still recovering. What should she worry? Is there something more that, than that? I don't think, you know, you have to trust that she's going to be in a good place. Um, you know, she should follow up with her doctors and, and make sure they feel uh, that she's progressing that they want to, the way they want her to. But I think she should also work on rehabilitation, uh, working on lung exercises, breathing exercises. You should get her one of those respiration things that are very cheap. It's the plastic thing that when you push in, 
the ball goes up. Did you ever see those? And those have been around for 50, 60 years. They still work. So she should practice that. She should do reps on that because there's never a time that she shouldn't be strengthening and recovering and working on her lung strength and lung capacity. As soon as she can, she should start walking. She should get serious about the foods that she eats and start to eat a cleaner diet, whether she decides to eat vegan or mead, you know, or paleo or keto or any of these diets, they're all good if she does them well. So she should find a diet that she's attracted to. I wrote a book on the Paleolithic diet, but it's not the only good diet. It's one good diet. The main thing is to, to dedicate yourself to eating clean, living a healthy lifestyle, working on lung strength, and I think that'll help her a lot. Um, hi, John. Um, John says, hope all is well with me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Matt is cracking me up. Um, so Sedar says... Um, he follows a lot of the different chiropractors on YouTube. Um, you know, some of us have a unique technique. Um, you know, thing on techniques and chiropractors is that um, a lot of times, you know, we, we're all in chiropractic school exposed to many techniques. And then the techniques that we wind up doing in our career have a lot to do with um, the way our bodies are shaped. So like a big guy like Dr. Uh, Bo Hightower, Dr. Gregory Johnson um, are going to do really, or they have the ability and the physique to do like these real power techniques. I'm not as big as those guys, but I was a wrestler and I'm pretty strong and I have really strong hands and forearms. And so even though I'm not as big as those guys, I do have a lot of power techniques. But I'm also very curious about the lighter techniques and the technical techniques, which don't make a good video. But I was always curious about blending light, light work and analytical work with meat, potato, forceful stuff. And I guess maybe that's, that's what I do that's unique. Um, but a lot of chiropractors, and if you went back and interviewed them, they'd say, yeah, you know, I was just good at that, that occiput lift right from the beginning. Or I loved when it was done to me, so I wanted to get good at that. And you'll hear those type of things. It's not that, it's, it's almost like the, the technique and the person are like a marriage. They have chemistry and that's why they evolve that way. That's my take on it. Hi, Simon. Thank you for connecting. Simon was sharing with me the other day that he has not had a chiropractic adjustment in a while. And I went from getting one to two chiropractic adjustments a week uh, for a long period of time because I share an office, uh, someone on staff with me, is her name is Dr. Kathy Ramundi. She's an amazing chiropractor. Uh, she works with me in the office with my patients. And um, she doesn't like to be on video. That's why she's never on video. But she gives me one to two adjustments a week, and it's great. And now I haven't got adjusted in three weeks. It's sad. Um, so let's see. Thank you, Simon, for your nice thoughts. Um, I appreciate that. And I have some other fun stuff to show you guys if you want to see some stuff. Hi, Juan. Thanks for connecting, Juan. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, and Sedar said, um, nice explanation. So, great. I'm kind of enjoying putting up... Oh, I have someone else. Uh, so, Fit Foodie, hi, Fit Foodie, uh, said, uh, how can I help the stiffness of my ankles from Achilles tendonitis? Woo, that's a big question, but... Remember that the Achilles, this is something we, a lot of people don't mentally visualize, but your calf muscle, which is two main muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, and they taper down. I'd show you my calf. I have a good calf, but I can't get it into the screen. But the calf tapers down and anchors into the heel. The muscle, in order to tie itself into the heel, needs to become more tendinous. So actually, the tendon is the end of the muscle. Remember, a tendon attaches a muscle to a bone. And the muscle itself is too bloody and pulpy. It would rip right off the bone and you would tear the muscle away every day from some muscle somewhere in your body. So the muscle or the body in its wisdom has crafted the end of every muscle 
where it attaches to the bone, it becomes less bloody, less capillaries, and more sinewy, almost like guitar strings. So it tapers down the muscle, turns to guitar strings, and that can sew itself into the bone. So the Achilles tendon is one of the largest, most powerful tendons in the body, and it, um, or if not the most, that's a good trivia, I don't know. Um, I think the sacral tuberous ligament's pretty powerful too, and the sacrum, but let's say the Achilles is the most because it's thick. It's like this thick. Um, when it gets inflamed or torn, it takes a long time to heal. And one of the reasons why tendons take a long time to heal is that they don't have the circulation that the middle of the muscle would have. So the middle of the muscle will have faster repair time because it has capillaries everywhere. And the tendon is avascular or without vessels. There's a little bit, but 90% less vessels than the belly of the muscle. And the tendons in here, look at, I'm trying to show up. There's my tendon right there. Right there is the tendon. The tendon is the end of, in this case, was the bicep. Uh, won't have that circulation, so it won't heal as fast. But it's also stronger, so it has more stability. Um, so get back to our food, fit foodies question, how can I help the stiffness of my ankle? So you're going to stretch more. Um, there is um, a lot of calf stretches you can find on YouTube, and um, you can uh, work on stretching it more. You can uh, try to dig a lacrosse ball in there. It's a hard angle to get. Uh, you, you know, acupuncture works really well for the lower calf tendon and the Achilles tendonitis. Um, and sometimes it just needs rest. All right, let's go on. Um, Rana, could you please explain about ankylosis spondylitis and what treatments are there? I have a, currently have a patient uh, that's been coming in and off and on for almost two year and a half, two years now. He's a young man in his early 30s and he has ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis, I, it's been a long time since I was taking my national boards, but what I remember it is an autoimmune variant. It hits men more than women. Um, and the spine starts to fuse at an early age uh, and you lose your flexibility, your spinal flexibility. So what this guy, this patient of mine is doing is he is constantly stretching. He actually became a yoga teacher, even though he uh, works in an accounting office. He still has his uh, business job, but on the side he teaches yoga because he got so good at yoga from stretching and working on it. I've never seen anybody manage AS or ankylosing spondylitis as well as, as this um, patient of mine. I'm really impressed. But it's become like a life effort because he doesn't want to... Um, move into his 40s, 50s, and 60s where his whole spine fuses. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very challenging, progressive, uh, you know, disease and of the spine. And I think you should, the thing I would say is take it on 100%, stretching, strengthening, do full body things like Pilates, swimming, yoga, things that stretch and make your whole body warm and flexible and you do it every single day hour to two hours a day would be the best and you never take a day off and you just push it's not what you wanted to hear but that's what's true um yeah so um simon says uh dr brenda mondragon i've never met her but she's great and she has great videos and a huge youtube channel uh she does a lot of different things she also uses the scraping um She's got great technique. She seems like a really nice person, too. Uh, haven't met her. Would love to travel around and meet some of these uh, YouTube chiropractors and trade treatments. Let's, uh, I have another video now, so let me go on and show you. Oh, so in the beginning I was mentioning I live in a part of Brooklyn uh, in Williamsburg where uh, it's a very uh, big Dominican Republic population and there's a fun barber shop that I go to and a lot of these I post on my Instagram and um, so here's a little video some of you have seen this before but it's fun it has a lot of personality you live <laughs> Oh, 
Agárralo aquí, chaval. Oh, Dale, agárralo. Ay, Dios mío, señor. Papito amado, Dios. ¡Oh! ¡Oh, shit! 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 ¡Oh, Uh, yeah. Yeah. Socio, socio, no socio. Wow. <laughs> How was that? Good. Good, good. You've done before. You remember? ¡Ay, One more. Ah. <laughs> ah. Dale. de ¿Eh? Ah, pues, ah, ¿Y de los míos? ¿Por qué estás como que hay ahí? Ah, vale. Vamos, de los míos. De los míos, 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 <laughs> okay, so um, I did one little thing with that clip and I put it up on TikTok and TikTok allows you to edit with music. So this was the version and it got a lot of, I think it got like 60,000 views in 48 hours um, on uh, Instagram, because I made it, I edited it on TikTok, I bought it over to Instagram, reposted it on Instagram. My TikTok account has been a little disappointing. I've put up about 60 or 70 videos and I haven't really hit TikTok big. And I know you're probably laughing going, that's because you're in your 50s. But anyway, the TikTok, uh, I play with different social media and that one never really hit it. But I like the editing part of it. So after I edited it, almost couldn't say that word, I, um, imported it over to Instagram, put it on Instagram, and the same video on Instagram got, you know, like I said, I don't remember how many, 60, 80,000 views on, this is the edited version of it, it's only 20 seconds. <laughs> so um i have really fun staff um my office manager for the last two years her name is rena sometimes she pops into some of the videos and holds someone's legs while i do a ring dinger um and this is us playing around with the boomerang let's see if i can find it oh here it is That. So here's a uh, question I also get. I put this up a couple of live streams ago, but since I keep getting the same question, um, you know, people probably didn't see that live stream, so I'm repeating this, which is how we shoot these videos. So I'm talking about YouTube now, uh, not Instagram. Instagram, I usually just run into the room with my phone and hold my phone up and just uh, 
shoot, or I hand it to Rena or one of the other people that work in my office and I just say, shoot this. And we hold the phone, we hold the phone vertically uh, for Instagram. But this you can see is a rig that I bought on Amazon. Uh, the frame that holds this, that clips this in, probably costs like $15. And then um, the light on top costs 10, but I spent the most on the microphone. The microphone is made by Rode, R-O-D-E. And uh, it's, they make really good mics. And this one, it's a directional mic that clips into the side of the iPhone. And there's a sock on it. Um, I forgot what they're called, like dead mouses or something. But anyway, uh, it sticks on the end and it cuts out some of the ambient noises. And this up here is the light. Uh, so I have a couple other examples of that. But this is what it looks like on Amazon. Again, there you see the Rode mic. It's a different type of road mic, but I, we, we use this one sometimes. It's a bigger mic. And so someone even today on this uh, live stream said, how do you get such good sounds? It depends which mic we use. You know, the, the mic you see in that picture, if we lean in on that, just as you're hearing the neck crack, you're going to hear it really good. You would also hear, you know, if I took a piece of paper and did it near the mic, right? But if I just did it nowhere near the mic, you won't hear it as well. Now watch, I'm moving it towards the mic. So just imagine a crack. Here I'm gonna crack my knuckle right near your mic. Let me see if I can get something to crack. Can't get anything to crack today. I need my daughter. My daughter can make any knuckle crack. But so it just depends on the mic and depends how closely you get to the mic. Here's a, a behind the scenes I don't think I've showed you yet. So we're about to shoot one. Um, and then you're at the computer a lot during the day or at desks and computers. So I feel up in here. People basically uh, line up when we do these. I'll announce that I'm gonna do one on a Saturday morning and uh, sometimes people drive in from long distances or come in to do them. Uh, and I pick Saturday because I can control the quiet part of the office. Like we have these tables that like roll out your back. They're traction tables that, and it makes a lot of noise. So we can't film at the same time. So I just like to shoot these YouTube videos on days that we don't have a normal practice with people that are paying to see me and, and want that full attention. So we, so we do it on a special shooting day and I might do 20 to 25 people in four hours. So they're lined up, we bring them in, I ask them really quick, what's gonna be your chief thing today? And they say, oh, it's neck and lower back. I go, great, let's get started. And um, I know Vega's uh, joked with me before because I always say the same thing, I always say, so we have Vega here today. Vega, what do you want to work on today? And so here we are rehearsing for 30 seconds with someone. Watch this next video. So we have Katie here today. She is an actor, singer, dancer, dancer and dance teacher. And dance teacher. Okay. So we have Katie here today. She is an actor, singer, dancer, dancer, dancer and dance teacher. And dance teacher. Okay, good, good. Uh, what do you want to work on today? What are some spots? Um, the right side of my back has been bothering mm -hmm. me. I was, okay. I was in a dance class and I think I like did something to a muscle, but now my back might be a little out of line. Okay. Uh, my neck hurts a bit, I think, because I teach the little ones, so I'm always looking at them. <laughs> yeah, that would do it. That's almost yeah. like text messaging. Exactly. Right? I'm like, same angle. I have to look in. But, um, yeah, because anytime yeah. your neck is down at this level, whether you're looking at little children mm -hmm. or into a cell phone, it pulls on the back muscles there, and those oh, muscles okay. go all the way down to mid shoulder blade level. So then it's like all affecting, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. It's basically just the whole right side of my body needs some help. All right, cool, cool. We're gonna do that. We're gonna get you on the table first. You're gonna be facing. All right, so Vega asks what's on my... That's me with a horse that I just adjusted, and the horse loved my adjustment so much, it tried to kiss me. It's true. Um, any questions? That's a llama. I have not adjusted a llama, but it is on my bucket list. 
Any other questions? I practice. Uh, someone says you're tearing me apart. Hmm. So here's uh, Daniel has a question. Um, what chiropractic school did I go to? Did I enjoy it? It was a tough time of my life, so it's hard to say you enjoy it. Uh, I went to uh, Life Chiropractic College in, in Marietta, Georgia. It's part of Atlanta. It's a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I graduated in June of 1998. It was approximately four years, but I was there a year early to do prerequisites. I still needed organic chemistry, biochemistry. I needed... Uh, calculus. I needed um, a few other courses before I could begin. So I moved with my family down there. Um, my daughter was born after the first year of school, um, but my son was with us. Um, so it was uh, a tough time. I think for four years, I think I averaged about four hours of sleep a night for four years. So that's the part that wasn't so fun. I love the school though. You know, it was a great education for me. Um, People complained about the parking, there was no place to park, and there's always people complaining about everything. But um, I liked it, I liked my fellow students, I liked the professors, I liked the, uh, the atmosphere, I got to work on a lot of people, I felt like it was an international school, I enjoyed that. Um, the campus was fine for me, and um, I think it's really what you make of it, because I was like determined, if I'm only gonna sleep four hours a night, I have a young family, I was like determined that I was going to learn as much as I can because I'm paying a lot of money and putting in a lot of commitments. So I finished with, uh, graduated with high honors. I think I finished with like a 3.95 grade point average, which is really good on a scale up to 4.0. Uh, and some semesters I had four O's. Uh, so I really hit it hard. Uh, there's some people that graduated chiropractic school that are not good chiropractor adjusters, but they were like the best students. And then there's some people that didn't get good grades that are amazing chiropractors, like their hand skills are great. But I kind of wanted to do both. I wanted to graduate or really be strong academically and also be strong technically. And I hit that goal. So it's something I can proudly say I, I did achieve. I haven't achieved a lot of different things in my life, but that's something I did really well. Um, here's another quick compilation. Oh. Do you hear that? Oh. 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 Oh my gosh. Someone pointed out to me that I say nice a lot when I adjust. I had no idea I did that. So for 21 years, I just adjust people and I go, nice. And then people start leaving that in the comments. Well, first of all, I didn't even know that they were leaving that in the comments. The comment would simply just say, nice. And I'm like, okay, thanks. I didn't know what that meant. But then I didn't realize they were kind of teasing me a little bit or picking up on that. I say that quite a bit. So obviously now I'm, you know, a year later and I'm doing, as I showed in the first slide, I, we had 1.4 million views. So I do get a lot of comments now and I don't see it all the time, but when I do see it, I know what they're referring to. Um, and I guess I do say nice a lot. Um, let's just go back to the last. Oh. Right here. Ah. Good. 
Nice. Nice. Drop one more time. Got it. So, um, that's true. I say that. What can I say to that? Um, so I wanted to uh, tell you about this dog that we had in the practice for a couple of years. So I have this great client named Zoe. That's not the name of the dog. The dog is named Stella. And Zoe worked nearby. She built costumes for Broadway shows. She's very talented. And one day she, a lot of people bring their dogs in while they get adjusted. And this specific dog is so gentle and so quiet, you hardly notice it's there. And it, it's this great, you know, a lot of people say that they have service dogs and we all know that it's not really a service dog. They just want to be able to fly in an airplane with the dog. This dog literally is a service dog. This dog used to go into hospitals and soothe people that were, you know, sick and infirmed and was a legitimate service dog. So I said, well, what do you do with the dog when you leave here? She always took like an 8 a.m. appointment. And she said, oh, I, I drop it off at a, a place that boards dogs and I spend a lot of money here in New York City. And I said, I would board that dog and you can come get it at 5 p.m. today and I'm not gonna charge you anything. So for almost three years, this dog Stella um, came in and would be under the desk quite a bit or sometimes would come out and visit people and it was very gentle and a lot of times people would forget the dog was there and Stella died about two months ago. She um, had, um, I think she had adrenal disease. The family moved to Colorado just before she died and she was going blind and she wasn't very old. She was only um, about eight years old, but it broke my heart. Stella's a great dog and, um, but, and was a big part of the practice because um, I would go out to the waiting room to get people to come into the office and, um, you know, it would be, let's say Vega, it would be Vega's turn to come in next to get her treatment. I'm using Vega, I'm using your name, Vega. And Vega would be sitting on the couch with Stella, you know, rubbing Stella's head and would not want to leave to come in and take her appointment time. That's how popular this, this dog was. And yeah, so Siobhan, who's just chimed in, loves Stella. Yeah, everybody loves Stella. Stella was such a great dog. And so we lost Stella. Um, all right, I'm debating whether to show this to you, but towards the end here, I'm going to show you this video. Um, so this next clip is how I've been spending my time in quarantine. Ready? Don't say I didn't share stuff with you. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but I was going to, I think I'm going to drag this over to next week, um, which was my experiencing, uh, my experience working down at Ground Zero during 9-11. Um, it's a big deal time for me uh, to come down and work there. And that's actually a picture of me before my hair got really gray, but I'm working on a rescue worker. And... The reason I was thinking about that is look how everybody's wearing masks. So everybody down there was wearing masks and everybody around here in New York's wearing masks. I'm sure maybe you have that too where you live. Um, so I will do a segment next live stream and talk a little bit about what I did that day and the days following 9-11. So on September 11th, 12th, 13th, I was down at Ground Zero uh, volunteering. And that will be in next week's section if you come back. And, or if not, you can always watch it, uh, you know, the, the tape, the archived replay. Um, thank you. Oh, this is, uh, Noiga says that. Uh, um, Noiga has more questions about wrestling. I don't know what... So Noiga has a question about getting, um, I don't know what that means, bone, bone joints get blocked. Hmm. That doesn't translate well. Uh, what, what's your first language and where are you from? Maybe that will help me. But I didn't have any coaches. Like the last time I wrestled, I was 
18 years old and now I'm in my 50s so I don't <laughs> you know I don't know anybody from that part of my life that works on injuries of wrestlers uh, so I'm just sharing that I'm not trying to avoid the question I'm just saying I don't know who I would I don't think it's important that you uh, get your treatment from someone that's a wrestler you need to get your treatment from someone that works with sports injuries because it doesn't really matter like let's say you're doing a thrusting motion or a lunging motion or a, you know you pick someone up and toss them or, or whatever you do uh, those physical or physiological motions are not solely just a wrestler's motion when I when it comes down to the injury so did the ankle get pronated did it get hyper pronated did it did it did you roll it in inversion um, it doesn't matter whether you did it playing tennis gymnastics uh, wrestling crossfit uh, lifting up your four-year-old in your living room could create the same type of injury um, so if you're a high level wrestler or an international level wrestler you probably have the answers right where you train you'll just ask your coaches and your trainers who um, you should go to in your local area that's where I would go and see what some of your buddies and friends have done with their injuries and their joint pain injuries but it does not have to be a wrestling specialist it has to be a sports medicine doctor or a sports physiologist or a sports chiropractor or a sports osteopath but someone that uh, welcomes those type of athletic injuries um, Jill says she loves animals oh I got someone else here from Italy uh, Fausto Demura from Italy I hope you're well there I know that was a tough place for COVID um, little jazz there so I wanted to say goodnight. Uh, we went over a little more than an hour. I hope everybody enjoys this and I'm going to do one next week. So thank you very much and uh, hope you had fun and uh, tried to make this entertaining and fun at the same time as well as educational. Good night.